Welcome back, everyone. I'm Pam Greenwald, and I'm sitting in for your host, Gabrielle Carteris, uh, SAG after President Gabrielle Carteris, for this uh, next segment. And this next presentation is one that we really wish we didn't have to give. Um, it's not news, I think, to any of you how nefarious deep fake videos are. First, there's the issue of using someone's likeness without their permission or without compensation, which is problematic, hugely problematic on its own. But when you add into it the often seedy, pornographic, and intentionally incendiary nature of how images are misused in deep fakes, it becomes a really gross violation of a performer or broadcaster's right to privacy, intellectual property, and consent, not to mention dignity. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. In large part, what we're talking about is digital sexual violence. That's why fighting deep fakes is one of SAG-AFTRA's top legal and legislative priorities. With that, I'd like to turn it over to SAG-AFTRA's Assistant General Counsel for Intellectual Property and Contracts, Danielle Van Leer, for a brief but powerful update on the state of deep fakes and what the union is doing to confront, combat, and hopefully get rid of them. Danielle's been working on this, uh, the front lines of the deep fakes issue for months, and it's great to have her here with us to bring you up to speed on all that she's been doing. Thanks, and uh, Danielle, welcome. Uh, thank you, Pamela. It is nice to be here today to talk about a subject that I really enjoy uh, talking about. The graphic you're seeing on the screen right now is samples of videos that Google contributed to the FACE Forensics Benchmark, which was an effort between two universities to help develop technologies to detect and combat deep fakes. To generate these videos here, they used pairs of actors that were selected randomly and a deep neural network swapped the face of one actor onto the head of another. I do have to preface my remarks by saying that I'm, I'm a huge nerd, I, I freely admit it. And there are aspects of this technology that really excite me, um, but the technology is advancing so rapidly and without restraint. And I find that a little bit terrifying. So for the next 15 or so minutes, we are going to talk about both the good and the bad. Uh, if we could roll the video. Fates has ordained that the men who went to the moon to explore in peace will stay on the moon and rest in peace. For every human being who looks up at the moon in the nights to come, will know that there is some corner of another world. Fates has ordained that the men who went to the moon to explore in peace will stay on the moon and rest in peace. Yes, that was me as Maleficent and Wonder Woman. <laughs> as a lawyer, I think I often feel like a villain or hero, depending on what I'm working on and who I'm working with. But the reason I include them here is that I was able to create those videos using a simple app on my cell phone in about a minute. And all it took was a single selfie. So that's how far this technology has come in just a few short years. Is this all harmless fun? Uh, maybe. Uh, I've seen posts on social media, though, where fans have used these apps to face swap actors onto other actors in these scenes. And while that may seem like having harmless fun, it, it's also potentially normalizing something that, that seems harmless in 10 or so second snippets, but has really broader implications as this technology advances and develops. So um, in, like I said, in just a couple years, we went from meeting thousands of images and a reasonably powerful computer to the ability to do all of this with just one photo on a mobile phone. Um, when I first started doing these kind of presentations a little over a year ago, I asked one of our IT uh, guys to create a deep fake of me that I could use as an example. So in that case, he shot a brief video of me and then he had to leave his computer on all night to generate it. And it was a high powered you know, laptop. 
and it still didn't come out right. Um, you know, I played with this app for about 10 minutes and I had half a dozen short video snippets to choose from. So this, uh, you know, these apps are now putting this powerful technology in anyone's hands with literally no expertise. Um, and Gabrielle's introduction this morning was right. There's a very dark seedy side to deep fakes. In doing my research over the last couple of years, I've seen things that made me wish those flashy neuralizer devices from the Men in Black movies were real. I've read horror stories about the harm inflicted on women by these videos. Um, our performers, especially women, have already had to worry about traditional filmmaking techniques being used to double them in the nude or in sex scenes. Flash of nudity here or there that implies the actor's participation but it doesn't actually show them participating. Deep fakes will put them right in the action and you know, without, potentially without their consent. So like I said, it isn't all doom and gloom. And, um, and I will say, yes, I am a lawyer, so there is a PowerPoint here. So let's start with what deep fakes are and are not. Merriam-Webster's dictionary defines deep fakes as an image or recording that has been convincingly altered and manipulated to misrepresent someone as doing or saying something that was not actually done or said. This definition is, is closer than some of the past ones, but it's not entirely accurate because it encompasses a whole host of content that may not actually be deep fakes. Uh, there's a, another term, shallow fakes or cheap fakes, which are videos that may be altered and manipulated and fall within this definition as well. But what distinguishes deep fakes from those other ones is the use of artificial intelligence to manipulate and alter the videos, where shallow fakes or cheap fakes use traditional editing techniques such as speeding up video, slowing it down, snipping out parts of it to make it seem like something else. Um, so usually when I do these presentations, I do a whole introduction on how deep fakes are created, but that would take a lot longer than we have in this brief presentation, which is intended as more of an update. So I've, I include this Venn diagram I created, which helps visualize at least the three key elements of deep fakes. As I mentioned, they're always going to involve artificial intelligence. Um, they're always going to be false. It's right there in the name, fake, right? Um, and then automation. These are created automatically by the algorithm that's running in the background by the artificial intelligence, which is called a deep neural net network. And deep fakes in, um, in, are always going to incorporate all three of these elements. Um, so when I was preparing for this, uh, this presentation, I came across an article from the December in the MIT Technology Review that described 2020 as the year deep fakes went mainstream. And looking back, that seems pretty accurate. Um, I wanna take a few, these are, these are the, the categories um, and the reasons why they, they uh, posit that it's the year it went mainstream. And I wanna take a look at a few of these categories before we re return back to the particularly scary side of of this technology. So in the recent documentary, Welcome to Chechnya, uh, the producers actually used deep fakes to protect the identity of the LGBTQ individuals they interviewed in Russia, um, primarily, if I recall correctly, all gay men, um, um, because these individuals were living in hiding to avoid being tortured or killed under the restrictive laws um, in Chechnya, in Russia. And the, what they did was they used images of LGBTQ activist volunteers whose facial structure somewhat resembled the individuals and basically used deep fakes technology to replace the, the people um, for, the, for their participants safety. And even in this context, there are ethical concerns when you start thinking about documentary uh, productions and uh, truth and uh, versus, uh, you know, blurring those lines. Uh, but I think those are way beyond the scope of a 15 minute update. So we will uh, move on to the next topic, which is uh, politics and education. So in the introduction video that we ran, there was a clip of Richard Nixon reading a speech that he never gave. It was a speech that had been prepared in the event the 1969 moon landing had ended in disaster. 
the producers, this was part of a, a film project where the producers used deep fake technology to recreate Nixon's audio and video and make it seem like Nixon was giving the speech. Uh, it's part of a website, uh, you can find it at moondisaster.org, that provides an interesting lesson on disinformation and how easy it can be to manipulate content. You know, and thinking for the future, imagine that video was not a long dead Nixon talking about a failed moon landing, but current President Joe Biden announcing that we're going to invade North Korea and think about the ramifications that could have. And speaking of not North Korea, um, Experts have long feared that deep fakes will be used to influence politics. For the most part, so far, videos used in political disinformation campaigns have been the shallow fakes or cheap fakes that were edited using traditional means. Um, there have been examples of deep fakes being used in other countries to manipulate public opinion. We won't get into those details again because there just isn't time, but this example shows on the screen shows the evolution of a Kim Jong-un deep fake. In this case, it was created by a nonpartisan advocacy group called Represent Us that was being done to encourage voter registration and voting to, to talk about the importance of democracy and um, voting. But um, as I said, in other countries, there have been some deceptive uses already. So talking about going mainstream, you know a technology has gone mainstream when it makes it into commercials and is being used by the ad industry. In this uh, Hulu ad, which I believe there was a clip in the opening video, self-proclaimed deep fake versions of Saquon Barkley and Baker Mayfield promote the return of sports during the COVID era to Hulu. Uh, Hulu has done a few different commercials using this technology, as have other advertisers including a State Farm ad that aired on ESPN where SportsCenter anchor Kenny Main was de-aged and it was made to look like the commercial took place decades ago. Also in the entertainment context, there is a web series created by the creators of South Park that uses real actors face swapped in with political figures. The host of uh, their show uh, utilizes a deep fake of Donald Trump and um, many other political figures are interviewed in the context of their show, uh, which is intended as parody or satire, depending on how you look at it. Um, so, you know, this creates some interesting questions as far as the use of deep fakes in the entertainment industry, but it, it certainly seems like at least in, in a novelty concept, they're here to stay and potentially various technologies will be used going forward. In the introduction video, we also included a clip of a virtual news anchor in China. In this case, he's wholly digital and they have versions in English and Chinese and they have multiple anchors now. Um, and they use audio and video deep fake technology. The, the deep fake in that case was modeled off one of their existing anchors, which I believe you, that's him in the bottom left corner. And um, it's been around for well over a year now that this uh, technology has been at least uh, demonstrated. Uh, raises interesting questions about the future of news and broadcasting and uh, truth in news and broadcasting as well. Audio deepfakes are one of those examples where the application can be good, but it's also become problematic in other respects. A lot of the early research into audio deepfakes was with the idea that they could, for example, help people with degenerative diseases who were losing their ability to speak. You know, they could provide samples of their own voice. And then the technology can communicate, can let them communicate in their own voice rather than using a digitized voice um, as they lose their own ability to speak. But as like with the, the video I showed of myself at the beginning, the technology has improved and become much more accessible and easy to use. So I, I have an example here of a YouTube channel called Vocal Synthesis where this user takes publicly accessible audio of uh, famous people, um, feeds text, like in this case, you can see the book of Genesis being read by Bill Burr, um, and uses it to generate new audio tracks. Uh, this, this channel made news a few months back when Jay-Z tried to get the audio tracks that used his 
rep replica voice taken down under a copyright claim. And YouTube did take it down initially, but then reinstated them because when you look at it, there, there actually is no copyright involved here. Um, they're not repurposing existing audio. It's wholly newly generated. And that's going to become an interesting question down the line. For other aspects of labor, a lot of companies working on these technologies are doing it for the purpose of replacing worker and, and not just actors. It uh, can be used for phone customer service and other areas where you might normally expect to speak with a human. This, this technology troublingly has also been at the heart of various fraud attempts in recent years. It, it's been used to commit a new equivalent of the business email compromise attack, which you may be familiar with where people will send a spoofed email looking like it's coming from a senior executive asking accounts payable to transfer money to a account that is supposed to resemble a vendor's account but isn't the correct account and so they're getting money that way. Um, in a couple instances, scammers used an audio deep fake that sounded like a corporate executive to convince their accounts payable person to wire money to the fraudster's account. In, in this case, you know, the because there's still idiosyncrasies in the audio, they just put like static over it to make it sound like maybe they were driving on a cell phone with bad connection. And if you've ever gotten one of those social media messages from someone who, you know, claims that they are traveling and lost their wallet and when your friend's phone has been hacked, imagine adding audio to that. Someone calling up a grandparents saying their child grandchild has been in an accident and needs money to um, pay for the health care or whatever. Um, that is uh, posited to be on the horizon. Uh, on the other hand, it's not all gloom and deep doom. It may open up interesting new art opportunities, particularly for actors. Take the Hulu commercials and the Sassy Justice show I mentioned, for example. These combine deep fake technologies with actors playing the part live, um, something that was required a lot of complicated special effects in the past. And in the videos, um, like the Nixon video we, we showed, an actor was hired to perform the mannerisms, um, et cetera, that would have been, uh, you know, to, to duplicate Nixon, as you can see from this slide here. And thinking to the Kenny Main Sports Center ad where they used early photos of him to de-age him, it could be a new way to do a flashback scene and film and TV without an actor having to sit through hours and hours of makeup and without complicated ex expensive effects. So there is the potential that this creates new opportunities. Um, there's also good uses for these technologies. Some researchers have suggested their algorithms could be embedded into video conferencing software so when you're looking into a webcam off the screen like this, your face also ap actually appears to be looking straight ahead. Um, some of these technologies could allow for performance capture with less equipment. And in the educational sphere, um, what if a painting or statue could be brought to life as with Mona Lisa or David in the meme video that was included in the introduction video? Um, imagine that as you're walking through the, muse the museum. But at the same time, we do need to consider the human cost of this technology. We need to ensure that it's being used ethically and ensure that people have the ability to control and share in the benefits from the use of their images and voices. So let's look at some of the really dark side of deep fakes. And this is what you've probably heard about with them in the news over and over again. Um, Obviously the biggest still remains the fake pornography and uh, fake nudity. And that's really what's brought our attention to, to the technology initially. Well over 90% of all deep fakes and some estimate it's actually closer to 96% feature non-consensual nudity and sexual content. And it's virtually all women. It, it, at this point in time, celebrities are by far the biggest victims but they're not just celebrities. People are using them to uh, create deep fakes of women they have crushes on or their exes who have scorned them in, in their eyes. 
and they've even been used to try to discredit female journalists. Um, these concerns over non-consensual nudity and sexual content led us at SAG-AFTRA to introduce legislation in California and New York over the last couple of years, and it's now in effect. Um, while the legislation does not ban uh, deep fake nudity outright, it does require that the individual depicted be given the right and ability to consent, or if they so choose to refuse to consent to the use of their image in this kind of content. Um, it requires that the consent be in plain and understandable language and that it be in writing. So a lawyer can't just slip it into the boilerplate of their contract as many of, of us are fond of doing in many cases. Um, it has to be understandable. They have to understand what they are consenting to. And it imposes very severe penalties to potentially anyone involved in the creation and distribution of unauthorized digital nudity or sexual content. Um, the California law in particular allows for very significant financial recovery in the form of um, high dollar statutory damages. So this new legislation has the potential to be a very powerful arrow in victims quivers going forward. Fake news is on this list. Um, as you saw from the examples in the, the video and earlier in this presentation, uh, fake news could become very literal with fake acres. Um, likewise, the risk of this technology taking control out of the hands of actors and others and replacing them in, in performances and their jobs. And it also all ties into the use of um, deep fakes in politics it, it leads to an erosion of public trust because seeing is believing in, as the saying goes. And if it gets to the point there's such a proliferation of deep fakes that people can no longer believe that what they're seeing and hearing is true, you end up with an erosion in public trust in journalism, in other content as, as you go. And, and that has a, um, you know, a really chilling effect on society and particularly democracy. So the part of the problem with deep fakes is that the law has been very slow to respond. I, I mentioned that we've worked on legislation in California and New York, and there's other groups out there that are working on other types of legislation. Um, this slide gives a couple of examples of just why um, the law as it currently stands is very limited. You know, there's no copyright, it, there's probably no invasion of privacy, although um, there are some jurisdictions that represent uh, that recognize the uh, false light type invasion of privacy. Um, defamation is probably uh, a difficult claim to bring because if it's on a site that makes clear it's a deep fake, uh, there's no falsity. It's being, you're being told right up front that it's fake content. Um, there have been efforts to combat deep fakes. As I mentioned, there have been legal efforts. Uh, this is a topic that does have bipartisan support at the federal level. And although primarily the legislation thus far has provided for funding of research studies, uh, internationally, there have been research and other legislation in the works. And there's a lot of effort into uh, technological solutions and ways to combat it. And on the news and journalism front, newsrooms are taking this very seriously and are training uh, and finding ways to spot deep fakes before they release content that could be doctored. And even on the platform side, um, Facebook, Twitter, et cetera, they have created policies that uh, address um, and allow some of this content to be taken down from their platforms. You know, thankfully, with the nudity and sexual content, the platforms all have uh, policies that prohibit that kind of content and people can have it removed. The other fake news type content or other forms of deep fakes are a little bit tougher, depending on um, the nature of it and which platform. Um, but there is effort to try to remedy some of these issues. A and we are also taking effort in some of our contracts to address this. As Duncan mentioned on his earlier panel, um, we have rules in place around digital scanning 
And one of the things that we've done with our lower budget contracts is to put uh, prohibitions in, in there about using uh, this type of technology either to insert people or to double people. And they really, they need to come to the union to bargain with us to you know, make sure that we are putting appropriate fences in place to protect our members. So with that, I'd like to thank you and I will pass this back to Gabrielle. Danielle, thank you so much. Thank you so much for that. The deep fakes has been very, uh, to watch its progression and to understand how we're approaching it has been very meaningful because it's really frightening actually. And the idea that so many women are um, victimized by it is another topic on itself. Um, I wanna say to the audience, you know, here we are in Zoom and of course, with that technology that we love, there are also some things that come up. So we apologize for some of the techn technological glitches that are occurring, but um, it was a great presentation. So thanks. Mm -hmm.